Thanks for letting me know, Richard. Morning, sir. How are we doing today? All right. All right. What did I say you got to Artistic
Democrat Shepherd of the Lakes Lutheran Church, where it is our joy, as always, to share our shepherd with you, no matter who you may be. So we welcome those of you who are in attendance with us. We welcome those who are streaming online. Uh, we'd love it if you'd let us know that you're there in the comments. And we welcome any visitors who are with us today. Uh, if you are visiting with us, as always, we, we humbly ask you to fill out a welcome card that's in the chairs in front of you uh, with some information you're comfortable with sharing. Uh, we want to take an opportunity to say thank you for being with us today. You can place that in the offering plate as it passes by uh, in the service today. Um, today we continue in the season of Advent uh, under the theme of the King Shall Come. And it's in view of the fact that the King shall come that, that we say to each other today, Gaudete, rejoice. Gaudete uh, is a, a Latin title that, that traditionally the church has, has given this Sunday uh, in Advent a time to consider joy. And certainly what a time it is to consider joy, the joy that we know our King is coming to bring us, that joy that now becomes the defining characteristic of our daily life because the King came and because our King is coming again. That kind of joy is how we are going to uh, worship today. It's going to be how, uh, what we talk about in our readings and in our sermon for today. Now our order of worship is, is outlined for you in the worship folder. Um, we'll be uh, worshiping using uh, the service setting one, which you can find on page 154 in the blue hymnals in front of you. It will also be displayed for you on the screens this morning. Uh, we will begin our worship this morning uh, by going to page 524 in the blue hymnal to sing our opening hymn, Rejoice, the Lord is King. May the Lord bless your worship this morning. to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts. Words and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve 
our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. of praise, we continue with the lighting of the Advent candles. We light three Advent candles remembering Jesus, the light of the world. He came to defeat the prince of darkness. We remember Jesus who came to answer his people's prayers. John proclaimed him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We hear his call to see his light. We light three Advent candles as a sign of our trust and confidence. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Through your word and spirit, may our souls be blessed. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Hear our prayers, Lord Jesus Christ, and come with the good news of your mighty deliverance. Drive the darkness from our hearts and fill us with your light. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We turn our attention to God's word selected for today, beginning with uh, a reading from Isaiah chapter 61, selected verses. This is the joy that your king comes to bring to you. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up and the garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with our Psalm of the Day, Psalm 718. God is my strong salvation, which you can find in your Psalter, uh, the Great Blue Psalter, page 359. Uh, we'll hear the psalm and the psalm tone introduced, and then we'll join in singing.
second reading is taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. These words will serve as our sermon text for today. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. Uh, let us acclaim our gospel with our verse of the day and its spoken response. Alleluia. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Alleluia. Come to us, Emmanuel. Come and set your people free. Our gospel for today is taken from John chapter 1, selected verses regarding John the Baptist. Uh, we talk about, uh, here we hear how John came to talk about the joy that was to come, not from him, but from someone greater to come. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Now this was John's testimony. When the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask who he was, he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him then, Who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you were not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. I will join now in singing our hymn of the day when all the world was cursed. Uh, during the, the third stanza of our hymn, we invite, invite the, the young children to come forward for a children's message. Uh, after the children's message, we'll join in singing stanza four.
too right and that's why i set it aside with all the good chocolate stuff that's the stuff that's really special so i set that aside uh and fight every temptation to eat as much of it as as i possibly can but i set that aside because that's special that's what i what i really really want we know that through faith in our savior jesus god sets us apart he sets us up as something special he sets us apart to be holy to live holy lives, to live as his dear children. And it's because of what we're looking forward to that we do that. It's because of the joy that we're going to see very soon that we joyfully do that. We look to the manger, we see Jesus' birth, and we something that gives us total joy, something that gives us perfect joy. For in that manger we see baby Jesus, a Savior who came to save us from our sins, uh, a Savior who came to give us eternal life. And so it's because of that joy that, that, that we follow God's will for our lives, we follow His commands joyfully, because we know that there isn't anything that's going to take that joy away from us. Right? Let's say a prayer. Dear Jesus, Thank you for coming to bring joy to me and to all of your people. Help me in that joy to live as you want me to live. We know that you will help us, and we ask you to do that. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, on your way back, you guys can grab one piece of candy, and as they head back, congregation will join in singing stanza four. How do you handle it when someone comes to you telling you how you should feel, telling you how you should react in a certain situation? Someone who comes by and says, just be happy, be joyful, be thankful. Doesn't always sit right with us, does it, when someone tells us how we should be feeling, how we should be reacting to a certain situation. And as genuine as they may be in offering this advice to us, a lot of the time isn't all that helpful. And really, what right do they have to tell us that? They don't know what's going on. They don't know what's running through our minds. They don't have all of the facts. They don't know the kind of situation that we are really in. So it really shouldn't be up to them to tell us how to feel, how to think, how to act. I wonder if that's the kind of reaction maybe we had as we heard Paul speak his encouragements at the end of 1 Thessalonians. Especially because it seems so unrealistic. The way that that God calls for unending joy, that that's his expectation for us. 
But by the Holy Spirit, we see that's exactly what our Lord expects of us. It's what He desires for His people. Joy. Unending, perfect joy. It was for the joy of His people that He promised His Son. It's to bring about that joy in His people that the Son, our King, came It's by His coming that now joy becomes the defining characteristic of our Christian lives. His will, our joy. His will is that we have joy. And that joy is given to us in Christ, and it's done in us by His sanctifying. Paul's first letter to The church in Thessalonica was written early on in his ministry, and it was something that was co-penned also by Silas, his his travel companion, and also Timothy, a young pastor whom Paul was training, the same Timothy to whom two letters would later be written. They wrote this letter as a, a big encouragement for the Thessalonians in their daily Christian lives, as well as a little bit more instruction about the last day, about uh, uh, Judgment Day. And as Paul wraps up this letter, he kind of sums it all up. He gives one last final encouragement, and he does that by giving two different lists. One list uh, that deals with the everyday Christian life of the Thessalonians, and the other list is how the Thessalonians ought to interact with God's Word. In the first three verses of our reading, we have that first list containing three points. First, Rejoice always. For a believer, joy should always be present. Christian joy should always be expressed, regardless of whatever situation the Thessalonians would find themselves in. Two, pray continually. Now, Paul doesn't mean that the Thessalonians should never leave church, should never get off of their their knees praying, but noting that in joy... Every moment of the day, all of the things that happen, they are opportunities to continue uh, to speak with God, to to petition Him, to, to go to Him in praise, to go to Him in thanks. And speaking of thanks, Paul doubles down on that in his last point. Give thanks in all circumstances. No matter what they would endure, Thessalonians should remain grateful and thankful. But why? Why do those things, why this, this continual attitude? For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God commands that his people carry themselves this way each and every day. But note that it's not burdensome, because this is God's will for those whom he has made to be in Christ Jesus. Those who are in Christ have come to know of Christ's saving work and will have been given the joy that drives them to carry themselves in such a way. Now, to be honest, if you were to have someone that looked like that, maybe we'd think this person was a little weird. Seems like this person who's always smiling, never not smiley and bubbly, someone who always seemed to be talking to themselves, someone who had this unrealistic optimism and thanks about every single thing. You'd be a little creeped out by him, probably. You'd probably think that they weren't handling or going through whatever situations were going on in a healthy way. But when you, we are in Christ, kind of how it is. Now, it's not we're always bubbly and smiley people all the time, but this joy that we are given is is this spiritual optimism and certainty that isn't shaken by any kind of short-lived or temporary trial or trouble. It's not never getting off of your knees, but it's a constant recognition and seizing of the opportunities to continue to speak with your God It's being in this Christ-centered reality 
that looks around in joy of who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what is to come in Christ. It's where it all comes from. And so really, these, these really short points are really, really deep ways that we have to measure ourselves. A, a terrific opportunity to gauge ourselves in our daily Christian living as we carry out God's will. And what a great time of year to hear these words. After all, what is the season doing but pointing us to joy, pointing us to the perfect joy that is to come? So how are we conducting ourselves? Are we continuously rejoicing? Are we finding that joy is our normal habit? Or do we find ourselves falling into habits of, of a pessimistic, depressive outlook on ourselves and the things that are going on around us? Do we find ourselves conversing with our God throughout the day? Or do we find ourselves forgetting, ignoring, isolating, whether it be out of pride for ourselves or whether it be in doubt and worry? Do we take the time to recognize in gratitude what has only been given to us by God's grace or have we gotten a little embittered, a little unsatisfied, discontent with where we are, where we sit? We think about those descriptions, right? Always, continually, all circumstances. That's not what we've been. On the one hand, we know that by nature that's an impossible thing for us to be perfect as we should be. And we know we've got a lot working against us, don't we? We've got a sinful nature who loves to base our attitude and character only on the things that, that we can see, that, that, that we go through, that, that our, our happiness and joy will only be defined by if we get good stuff. If not, then we'll be unhappy. And of course, the devil loves to twist, to contort, switch up the truth to get us either to, to fall into sinful pride in ourselves and in what we do or to drive us to, to complete despair and doubt of our current situation. If we only had our current circumstances, if all we had was what was around us to bring our joy, we'd be left without it. We'd lose our, our commitment to pray. We'd run out of gratitude. But our joy is not rooted in this. Our joy is rooted and founded upon something far greater, something far more sure. It's the joy that we will hear the angels burst into song over. It's the joy we'll see the shepherds sprint into town to tell other people about. It's the joy we'll recall a mother in bewildered silence hold in her very hands. But a joy not just meant for her, a joy not just meant for the shepherds or the angels. A joy meant for all. A joy meant for you. Because your God willed it to be so. It was His desire that you have a perfect, lasting joy. And your King made it happen for you by His coming. It's a joy to know just as we heard in Isaiah that your broken hearts have been bound up. That you once captive to sin have been set free. You once in loss in the darkness of unbelief have been brought to light. You once who mourned over your death and punishment now have the hope of eternal life. By the grace of your God, by the grace of your King, you have been brought into Christ. Through faith in Him, you stand as that oak of righteousness. You have a joy that always remains with you. Your God has opened His line of prayer 
to Him. To constantly be able to go to Him. Day in and day out, He continues to pour out on you that which you can be grateful for. And in Christ, that joy, that perfect joy that's been given to you, won't and can't be affected by any kind of circumstance that you find yourself in here on this earth. And it was God's will to give it to you. And so in joy, we joyfully carry out His will. We follow God's will following those three points as well as the, the next five that come up in regards to His word. And as we use them, we have the certainty that we will be able to use them because we have a God who will have them done in us by His sanctifying. Paul starts his next list off this way. Don't quench the Spirit. The Holy Spirit enkindles faith like a flame. And the Thessalonians would be foolish to, to snuff out what the Spirit enkindles to let that flame die through disobedience and falling into unbelief. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. God gives his word and has it proclaimed through others for the increasing of faith and good works. And the Thessalonians shouldn't get in the way of God's word being preached and taught, nor they should they despise it and ignore it and turn away from it. Instead, listen. Listen to it preached. Listen to it proclaimed. But listen to it carefully. We take the last three points together, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. Take note and consider what is being taught and preached. If it is according to the truth that is in God's word, then listen to it. Take it to heart. Do and practice what is being proclaimed. But if it is contrary... If it takes away or adds to what God says in his word, don't listen. Don't indulge in it. Don't condone in it. Don't make it your habit. Don't practice that which is being preached evilly. Okay, but again, how? How are they to keep all of this in mind? How are they supposed to be able to do all of this? Paul ends with this prayer. May God himself the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It would be through the Holy Spirit and His work that the Thessalonians would be sanctified to do God's will. It only be by His grace that He would keep them blameless until the King would come again. But note that this prayer wasn't spoken uncertainly or in doubt. Paul finishes... The one who calls you is faithful. And he will do it. What God wills for his people, he brings it about through his work and power. How will they be sanctified? How will they be blameless? God will do it. Will he? Yes. Because he is faithful. Now since we're talking about this word sanctifying, this concept of, of sanctification... It's a good thing to, to review what it is. Right? To sanctify is to set apart as holy or to consecrate something. And a wider meaning, sanctification is the entire work of the Holy Spirit when he brings us to saving faith in Jesus. But more narrow meaning of sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit that leads us to hate sin and instead produce good works. Now, because of our sinful nature, sanctification is an imperfect, it's an ongoing process. Through the means of grace, the gospel and word and sacrament, the Holy Spirit renews us daily in our sanctification to carry out God's good and perfect will in joy. And so it's in joy that we do take these words to heart, that we take seriously the very thing that the Holy Spirit uses to work in us. That in the joy of forgiveness, we turn away that, from that which leads us to sin, that which leads us away from the truths of Scripture. 
and joy, we eagerly go to his word, listen to it preach, that we may grow in our knowledge, grow in our spiritual maturity. In joy, we look deeper into what is good and pleasing in God's sight. We desire to grow more and more in our lives of sanctification, to grow and grow in our faithfulness to our God. And yet, you know that complete faithfulness won't happen. It will never be perfect. Our sanctification will never be perfect on this side of eternity because of our sinful nature. Well, that doesn't mean we then get to give up or, or lose hope or lose that same joy. For it's by God's sanctifying that we desire to do that which is done in us, that we do what he desires. He continues to work in you through his word. Each day, you are renewed by his grace, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Each day, the Holy Spirit renews you in the joy of forgiveness and eternal life. And there isn't anything that will be able to take that away. So that when the circumstances and troubles and trials of this life come, you can stand up to them. You can endure them in joy and in thanks. And that joy is so certain because the one who gave that joy to you is the one who is perfectly faithful. He continues to renew you in word and in sacrament. He continues to keep you blameless in that perfect justification brought about by you, by your Savior, Jesus Christ, by your King who came for you. And you'll be kept that way until that sanctification is made perfect on the day that your King shall come for you. So it's not a bad thing to listen to this Advice about how to feel or how to act. For it's God and his perfect word telling us. And it's a good time to remind ourselves of that. Because guess what God does know? He knows you. He knows what you are going through. He knows the joy that he has given to you. And he knows that joy cannot be taken away by anything. It was his will to give you joy by sending his son. And now in him you certainly have that joy. It's his will that he daily sanctify you to live your life in that joy according to his holy word. Because of him that's exactly what you have, it's what we have. It's exactly how we get to live. His will, our joy. Amen. Please stand. Now to him who is able to do more than we ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Let us now uh, enjoy, confess the, the true faith of the, uh, the true Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We, we believe, believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of the one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was in 
continue now with the prayer of the church. Come, dear Savior, we long for your appearing. Come to cheer us with your promises as you once cheered your ancient people throughout their long night of waiting and watching. Come also to rekindle our joy as we prepare to celebrate your first coming. Do not permit a frenzied busyness to rob us of your peace or to deprive us of times to ponder and to wonder at your word. Set our hearts apart from the bustle and the clamor and the jostle of these days. Fill us with the quiet delight of finding you in the manger and keep our hearts and minds undisturbed by the great throng that streams by uncaring. We pray, we pray also for those enduring great sorrow, for those undergoing spiritual trial and for those whose restless hearts have no knowledge of your coming. Comfort, strengthen, and illumine them with the sweet peace born of your love and keep them in the way of peace by your holy word. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Come quickly, dear Lord, and fill our longing eyes with the light of your coming. We wait, we keep watch, and in you we put our hope. And in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated, and at this time we gather our thank offerings to the Lord. <laughs> stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and grace. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared when he called people to repentance and pointed to, the, to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Oh, oh.
thanks to you, O God, for your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We, we join, join together, together to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me then he took the cup gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink from it all of you this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me the peace of the lord be with you always Amen. Amen. Sins are 
are forgiven, depart in peace. Amen.
give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We'll continue now with our closing hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.